day. So thank you all ever so much for coming to our shop workshop around copyright issues in secondary data use. Um, today, 23rd of 24th of January is our first day of the workshop. Um, there are two half days of the workshop. We've tried to include as much information as possible. Um, and as we know, sitting in front of a computer for so much time can be quite tiring. Um, so we split it to two, two days. Um, we do have a break today. Um, and I do want to encourage everyone, if you feel your back is a little bit achy, do try to, to take a walk, have a cup of tea or coffee. So, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I did mention the presentations are being recorded. And once again, this does not affect the Q&A sessions. We want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable to ask as many questions as possible. Um, the slides will be available shortly after the event. We're going to email everyone with the PDF versions of the slides as well as the exercises we're going to use. And please feel free to use the exercises if you do this training to your colleagues or um, if you do related training, you're more and welcome to use the exercises. Questions can always uh, be written in the chat box, the Zoom chat box. Um, you can ask them during the question and answer sessions as well, or um, because we know sometimes it's quite um, tedious to have to ask questions directly. We have set up um, an anonymous Padlet. You can ask questions, um, which is available at the following link. I'm just putting it in the chat for ease of use. You can always ask questions um, in, the, in the Padlet as well. There is no um, names or uh, personal details collected by Padlet. Um, we have also a post-event feedback form. We would be very happy for you if you, if you have time to complete it, um, but that will um, be after the second day, after tomorrow, uh, once we have finished the event. So now, as I said, it's a Monday morning. Um, what better way to start the event than with a quick menti? And I'm putting it now in the chat. If you go to menti.com and you use the voting code 7561 Two, six. We will do a quick icebreaker. And now it's time for me to change the sharing of the screen. And I'm going to start presenting. Where are you joining us from? Uh, we know we have people from a number of European countries. We have Sweden, Glasgow, Slovenia, Norway. Yes, it can be the it can be the town as well. Um, home office, fantastic organizations as well. We have a couple of people from Slovenia, it seems. Norway, Finland, that is fantastic. There, there is a wide variety um, of countries. Netherlands, fantastic. We're actually using examples from the, from the countries that are joining us today. Um, so that is fantastic because if, you, if you're new to the copyright um, scene, uh, we hope those will come in handy as well. Um, Slovakia, yes. We have quite a few um, participants coming from different countries and the um, variety is fantastic and we do hope you'll find the international context um, of the copyright very useful. Um, we'll see there are a couple of things that apply to all the countries, uh, but they're quite specific rules as well um, when it comes to, to different countries and po Poland as well. Now, if we go to the next slide. We're going to present the next slide. What do you hope to gain from attending this event? It might be that you are new to the data sharing scene or that you are creating data and you want to make sure that um, you are not infringing copyright. What is the main aim um, for you um, that you have joined this event for? Once again, you can go to menti.com and use the code 7561-7526. Again, these are not linked to, to, to your person at all. Feel free um, to share everything, practical tips 
that's fantastic. We've um, included a lot of different links in the presentations as well. Um, and again, we're going to share the presentations with you um, so you can use them at your own leisure as well. Overview of issues, yes. Um, and we'll see when it comes to secondary data use, there are quite a couple of copyright issues depending on the licenses that are used. Copyright for data with personal information, audio and speech recordings, getting a better understanding about the copyright surrounding data and especially secondary use, restrictions on copyright, right? How can I share archive, news item, clips, articles I used in my research? We are covering exemptions of copyright, so we are going to be looking um, at fair dealing, so using, but how about sharing? How to train our users and scientists in using copyright for secondary data and practical tips? Again, more than welcome for you to use our slides, use our exercises and our um, resources that, that we're going to make available. If there are any consensus in the EU about secondary use of research data, we're going to see in terms of um, licenses, while they're similar, um, and a lot of them are used in quite a lot of countries, um, there are a couple of um, country specific um, rules as well um, that we need to follow. Reusing data containing parts of artwork. Um, again, we do have a presentation around what actually is secondary data um, and how copyright applies to all the different ones. So now I am going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Thank you all ever so much for taking part in the Menti. Um, today, we're going to have a variety of speakers um, that are going to present on different topics. Um, I have my colleague Hina Zahid with me. Uh, we also have Maureen Hacker from um, UKD as well and Anka Vlad. Um, and we have a guest speaker from um, our host organization, University of Essex, um, Hannah Pyman. Um, she does a lot of copyright um, and she's part of the research support team at University of Essex. Now, when it comes um, a little bit about us, most of the speakers, as um, you've seen, are based at the UK Data Archive, uh, which is the lead partner of the UK Data Service. Um, and we are known as a center of excellence in acquiring, curating, and actually providing access to the largest collection of social science and population data in the United Kingdom for over 50 years. Um, we provide a trusted digital repository and the main reason we have decided to create this event and we are ever so grateful for shock um, funding this event is because we've seen that a lot of researchers are struggling when it comes to, okay, I've done my project, I've used secondary data, but now I want to share it. What do I do? Can I share it? Can I not share it? And we thought this gap um, needs to be covered by a short um, workshop around um, copyright practices and how to make sure you're not um, infringing copyright law. Uh, UK Data Archive is also known for um, trying to lead international best practices in data management. Um, and as noted before, we are based at the University of Essex. As I said, we are very lucky to have this event sponsored by SHOCK, the Social Science and Humanities Open Cloud. Um, the project itself is funded by the EU framework program Horizon 2020, which unites um, 20 partner organizations and their 27 associates over um, for 40 months from January 2019 to the 30th of April, 2022. So we're almost at the end um, of the project as we know it now. The main aim of SHOCK is to provide this unified open cloud for data, tools and training for users of social sciences and humanities data. Shock has organized a number of different events. We have seen even in the audience, we have a couple of um, people interested in the train the trainer aspect. So how do I let others know? Um, uh, and Shock is very well known for that. What does Shock offer? So besides the on and offline training, there are quite a lot of face-to-face um, uh, -face now, as we know, the, the pandemic is slightly dimming down. 
it actually provides an international cross-disciplinary trainer network. So it links people that provide training with other people to get tips um, on how to provide an interactive in a nice online or um, offline training session. It also provides the um, social sciences and humanities open market, uh, where um, we will shortly see there are a couple of tools, fantastic tools that can be used from the different partners in the projects and also their data, which are all fully openly accessible. If you haven't heard of SHOP before, um, please do visit um, the website. I have seen in the registration quite a lot of you would like to be um, subscribed to the SHOP newsletter and an email will follow after the event with information about how to do that. Um, once again, SHOCK has a lot of different training opportunities and um, training materials available on, the, um, on their website. And we also have the SHOCK Open Marketplace, which offers open data. So if you're teaching more into analysis methods and how to use data, you can actually use open data from the shop open marketplace, um, but also tools that you might want to use in different training packs as well. We do have a future shock event um, around data management planning and overcoming challenges in social science data sharing. Um, this, is, this will be focused more on data management planning overall. Um, it will shortly cover copyright issues, of course, um, but it's much less focused than the one that we have today and tomorrow um, regarding copyright. So what are the learning objectives of today? And it's fantastic because they do link um, with what we've seen in the Mentimeter, a better understanding of copyright. What actually is copyright? What is covered in the copyright? What are the copyright exemptions? And we've seen we have a couple of um, people interested in that. How can I actually use and share um, the data that might be um, copyrighted, copyrighted, also a better understanding and appreciation of fair dealing, one of the copyright exemptions, we're going to be covering that. Actually, making the difference between the different data licenses that are available out there and how do you use different data depending on the license they're made available on and also what kind of license can you use if you want to share your data and of course we do hope you will be able to identify this diversity in copyright law when it comes to different countries. The day one program of course, we have the short welcoming introduction and thank you all ever so much once again for being here. Um, we have a short presentation on an overview of copyright, which covers the history of copyright, but we also have basic concepts around copyright, the presentation done by our colleague Hannah from Essex University. It will be followed by a short individual exercise in a Q&A session. Once again, please do use the Padlet. We will check the Padlet in the Q&A session as well, um, but feel free to unmute yourself, turn on the camera if you want for any questions you might want to ask. We do have a short 15 minutes break. Again, please do make sure um, you walk around a little bit. We don't want any back problems from the, uh, from the workshop. Then um, our colleague Maureen is going to cover what is secondary data, um, a very short uh, presentation around what secondary data researchers might use, followed by my colleague Hina describing the main copyright issues when it comes to using secondary data. The final presentation of the day is going to be around data licensing and copyright done by yours truly, Christina, um, and it's going to cover um, the different data licenses that can be applied that you most likely have always encountered and to actually bring a little bit of information around the fact that if something's available just on the web, but we don't know how it's made available, can I actually still use it? But it also focus on the benefits of licensing your data and actually making that data available uh, with a nice license attached to it. Thank you ever so much for your um, attention for the very quick introduction. And I'm now going to pass to my colleague Hina for the very first presentation of the day. I'm going to stop my share. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hina, and uh, I'm mainly 
um, responsible for the ethical and legal aspects of data within the research data management team based at University of Essex. Um, let me share my screen first. Can you all see my screen? Yes, all good. Thank you, Hina. You're welcome. So um, this sec uh, session will focus on what intellectual property rights are and the types of IP rights. Then I'll talk you through to the origins of copyright. And I will finish the session with some terms that we will be using throughout the workshop. So what is actually meant by intellectual property rights. Um, intellectual property is something that you create using your mind. For example, a story, an invention, an artistic work or a symbol. Type of IP rights include trademarks, which is a type of intellectual property consisting of a recognizable sign, design or expression which identifies products or services of a particular source from those of others. And um, Patents is another type of IP rights. It is an exclusive right granted for an invention. And third type of IP right is registered designs. A registered design protects only the shape or appearance of a product. It gives its owners the exclusive right to the design of that product, and it can be used to deter others from copying it or stop them from continuing to do so without consent. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the final type is copyright, which is the protection offered for creative works such as books, music, and literary works. You get some types of protection automatically, and for others, you have to apply for. Um, you are the intellectual property holder. Uh, sorry, I, I have switched off my camera because uh, of the speed issue with the internet. Um, you are the intellectual property holder if you have created a work and that work meets the requirements for copyright, a patent, or a design. You could also be considered as an IP holder if you have brought intellectual property rights from the creator or a previous owner or have a brand that could be a trademark, for example, a well-known product name. Having the right type of intellectual property protection helps you to stop people stealing or copying the names of your products or brands, your inventions, designs, and your literary works. Change IP rights can have more than one owner, commonly known as joint owners. IP rights can belong to people or businesses, these can be sold or transferred and allow you to make money from the work you own. Though there are different types of IP rights, but as you all are aware that this workshop is focused on copyright, so let's begin with the copyright. So in order to know about anything, I would always like to know its origin. So I would like to talk you through to the brief history of copyright. But before I begin, just a quick fun question, please. Uh, could you go to menti.com and use the code 73928294 to answer if you can guess when the co copyright concept of copyright started? I'm sharing my menti screen now. If you can guess when the concept of copyright started. Let's see what people think. 1850, 1700s, 1800s, 16th century, 1930. Yep, 1550. 
18th century. So most of the people think that it started in 18th century. You could say that all of these answers are correct. So there is a mix of responses, six for, uh, all the way from 1500s to 19. Are there any other responses coming up or shall I go to, go back to my PowerPoint slides? Thank you, thank you all. So, yeah, um, it does, um, it, it may vary country to country as you are from um, different countries. So it could be 1500, 1600. So these answers are somewhat correct, but the uh, cornerstones of modern copyright law, which is the right to be identified as the creator or the work and economic property rights have their roots in ancient Greek, Roman and Jewish cultures and can be traced back as far as the sixth century BCE in ancient Greece, but it was not until use of the movable type printing press uh, became widespread across Europe that the need for statutory regulation was realized. Um, the first recorded movable type printing or printing paper books was in China around 1040, 1040. These early presses used either ceramic or wooden movable type and were invented by Bi Sheng. By the 12th century, China was printing using bronze metal type. There are also records printing in Korea using bronze movable type dating back to the 14th century. In Germany, around 1440, a goldsmith named Johannes Gutenberg created a printing press that used metal movable type. The type was cast from an alloy of lead, tin, and antimony. The lead, tin, and antimony alloy melts at a far lower temperature than bronze, making it easier to cast. This meant that reusable metal molds could be used to cast the type, making it far quicker to produce the metal type. So a single Gutenberg press could produce around 240 impressions per hour, perhaps 2,000 to 3,000 pages a day, easily 100 times faster than hand printing or hand copying. This drastically reduced the cost of printing. Adoption of this press was fairly rapid. So in 1457, there was a single press in a print shop in Mainz. By 1480, there were 110 presses in Europe and anyone could buy or rent a press. And as there was no copyright law in Europe at that time, new works were quickly republished by competing printers. This brought about some very positive social changes in the short term. Uh, prices of reprints were low, output grew exp exponentially. So publications could be bought by poorer people and Europe. So a swift rise in literacy. As time went on, European governments set up systems of licensing controls over printers, issuing individual printers exclusive licenses to print a particular work for a period of time. This prevented other printers from reproducing the same work during that period, and this had the effect of maintaining a higher price for the work for that period to the benefit of the printer and the author. So as early as 1483 in the UK, Richard III recognized the value of literacy works and encouraged the spread of printing while at the same time seeking to limit and censor texts deemed to be harmful to the church and crown. So the Printers and Binders Act 1534 banned the import of foreign works and enabled the Lord Chancellor to limit the price of books. Further censorship was introduced by Henry VIII, who required that all books should be approved before publication. So in 1557, the Stationers Company received its royal charter, 
giving the company the power to decree who could print books and the right to seize illicit or pirated works. This was not copyright as we understand it today, but rather a rights granted to the printing company or publisher to copy a particular work. So the licensing of the Press Act 1662 built on this framework entitled as an act for preventing the frequent abuses in printing. And the stationer's company had the responsibility to, set, to censor literacy, literary works. The act had a two year duration clause and so had to be renewed by parliament every two years. But censorship led to public protests and in 1694 parliament refused to renew the act. Then the stationer's company campaigned for new legislation to restore their role. This failed, but the failure led to an important change in viewpoint familiar to modern copyright law. So instead of focusing on the printers and publishers, they now argued that the authors should have a right of ownership in what they wrote. So this argument persuaded parliament and led to the enactment of the first Copyright Act the Statute of Anne in 1710. So the world's first copyright law was the Statute of Anne enacted in England in 1710. This act introduced for the first time the concept of the author of a work being the owner of its copyright and laid out fixed terms of protection. Following this act, copyrighted works were required to be deposited at specific copyright libraries and registered at Stationers Hall, there was no automatic copyright protection for unpublished works. Legislations uh, based on the Statute of N gradually appeared in other countries, such as the Copyright Act of 1790 in the United States, but copyright legislation remained uncoordinated at an international level until the 19th. So, in 1886, the Berne Convention protection, uh, protection of literary and artistic works was held to further protect artists, musicians, photographers, designers, and the main aim was to provide mutual recognition of copyright between nation states and to promote the development of international standards for copyright protection. So a new fundamental principle was laid down, namely that copyright automatically exists from the day a creative work is available in a tangible form, for instance, when it is recorded or written down. The Berne Convention also states that the creator of a work doesn't need to apply for copyright or to register it. It automatically exists once it has been put into a fixed form. One of the biggest changes implemented by the adoption of Berne Convention was to extend copyright protection to unpublished works and remove the requirement for registration. So in countries of the Berne Convention, this means that an individual who owns the copyright of any work they produce as soon as it is recorded in some way, be it by writing it down, drawing, filming, or whatever the way it was created. It also formulates it also formulates rules regarding the copyright duration, copyright permissions, and expects all signatory nations to incorporate the law in their national laws. Uh, the Berne Convention does away with the need to register work separately in each individual country and has been adopted by almost all the nations of the world. So I think over 179 uh, countries uh, have joined the Berne Convention out of 190 nations. The Berne Convention remains in force to this day and continues to provide the basis for international copyright law. The main advantage of the treaty is that if copyright exists in one of these countries, then this copyright is valid in all member countries. This means that copyright automatically protects your work at a worldwide level. So, just out of interest, I found a list of the countries that are not members of the Berne Convention, but uh, I have listed this on the slide. 
but there is the possibility that these countries may be members of other international treaties or may have their own national copyright laws. So some points to keep in mind, although details of national laws, laws may differ, the basic rights are the same in most countries due to international conventions and agreements that provide a common frame, frame, framework that national legislation must follow to ensure countries respect the rights of foreign authors. While the earliest copyright law only applied to the copying of books, this evolved over time as society developed to include the wide range of literary and artistic works, including paintings, photographs, sound recordings, films and videos, software, music, and so on, and ext extended to include translations and derivative works. The current UK legislation is the 1988 Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which has been periodically updated to reflect changes or accession to international conventions, European law and societal changes. Most UK copyright works such as books, films, music remain protected in the EU and the UK because of the UK's continued participation in the international treaties on copyright. And for the same reason, EU copyright works continue to be protected in the UK. This applies to work made, made before and after the 1st January 2021. Um, there will be some more details on international diversity in copyright laws in tomorrow's session on copyright in an international context. Um, here I, I have explained few of the terms for you that we will be using throughout the session so that you can have a quick look as a reference point. So IP rights by now you are all familiar with this term rights given to persons over the creation of their minds. In, it includes trademarks, designs, patents, and copyright. Then license sets out what can or cannot be done with something, for example, the copy, copyright material or data. A database is a collection of independent works arranged in a systematic way. So it also has IP rights and fair dealing or use is a legal term that allows copying, um, reason, uh, copying reasonable proportion in some situations such as non-commercial teaching or research purposes. These will be discussed in detail in later sessions. So is there any question and on? Question and answer. Questions. Or shall I pass it over to Hannah? No questions yet on our Padlet, Hina. Thank you ever so much for the presentation. Um, everyone, please feel free um, to put any questions on the Padlet. Um, if you have any questions about the Padlet, drop me a message. Uh, we now have joining us um, Hannah Pyman from University of Essex. Um, Hannah, once again, thank you ever so much um, for joining us for the event. And the floor is yours. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, nice to see you all. Um, I'm Hannah. Um, I work in the library at the University of Essex um, and I'm the scholarly communications coordinator here um, in the library. Um, I've got a presentation for you this morning um, so I will share my slides um, and hopefully you'll all be able to see that okay. Um, so if I just go to... Okay. Um, Great. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, so I'm going to be giving kind of a quite um, introductory session today about copyright. Um, so as I say, um, I work in the library here at the University of Essex. And as part of my role, um, I mostly give advice to researchers about copyright. Um, so this mostly involves kind of guidance on copyright when it comes to publishing their work. Um, but also includes advice about sharing teacher materials in their classes and via virtual learning environments. Um, so these are kind of going to be the main, the main focuses of the presentation today. Um, so what I'm going to do is going to give you guys an overview of copyright in publishing um, and speak about the ways that this is changing at the moment with a few different developments and kind of funder policy and those sorts of things. 
Um, then I'm going to go through briefly about copyright in teaching and some of the things that we consider with our um, academics when it comes to thinking about the ways that they're sharing their resources um, with their students. Um, and that's going to take kind of the first half um, of the presentation. And then in the second half, I've got a sort of activity for us to do. Um, so we're going to use the uh, poll feature in Zoom, and I'm going to be asking you guys to um, vote on some of the kind of common copyright questions um, that we get asked um, here in the library from our researchers. Um, hopefully it won't be too straightforward for you guys, um, but it is an activity that we run with our researchers. So you can see it kind of from two perspectives. So one being um, you guys might learn some stuff about copyright, um, but also you can kind of see how we teach our researchers about copyright and how we get them thinking about it and get them kind of to build their confidence in answering copyright questions and just get them familiar with thinking about copyright from that perspective. Okay, but first of all, I'm going to speak a bit about copyright in publishing. Um, so when we're speaking to our researchers about copyright in publishing, the first thing we highlight is that it's really important to consider copyright right from the beginning of writing their manuscripts. Um, so when you're preparing a manuscript, we, we highlight to our researchers that the journal or the publisher will expect them as the author to sort out all of the clearance for third party material um, and give those appropriate attributions as and when they're needed. Um, and here, when we say um, the third party material, we're referring to the use of kind of substantial materials such as images, figures, tables, those kind of things. Um, not just talking about standard quotation that would follow the usual referencing rules and referencing formats that the journal or the publisher sets out. Um, but thinking more about the use of substantial materials um, from third party sources. Um, but what also is important to highlight is that how um, research is actually published affects the copyright implications for that work. So whether you're publishing in a subscription journal, an open access journal, hybrid journal, um, a standard monograph or an open access monograph will really influence um, the different things that you need to be thinking about in terms of copyright when you're publishing. So when we're thinking about subscription based journals, um, in most cases, um, through the terms and conditions of that subscription based journal, many researchers do sign over the copyright to the publisher. Um, so they give away their rights over that um, article. Um, and that would be the standard agreement that comes with a subscription based journal. Um, so it's important for our researchers to understand the implications of that and understand what that means for them further down the line in terms of reuse of that article um, if they do sign over the rights to the journal. So when they do that though, usually the researchers do keep the copyright to the author accepted manuscript version of the paper. Um, so that would be the version of the paper that is um, after peer review, but before the journal has added all the kind of formatting, the typesetting, the logos, the headers, all of that kind of thing. And um, so usually researchers keep the copyright to the author accepted manuscript, but we always encourage them to read through the agreements before they sign anything, um, because that isn't always the case. And also, as it says on the slide, there often is restrictions in terms of what you're allowed to do with even that author accepted manuscript, even though you do tend to retain the rights on that. Um, for example, in lots of cases when publishing with a subscription based journal, um, while you maintain, maintain the rights on the author accepted manuscript, there's often a term or condition that says that you must have an embargo period on the sharing of that author accepted manuscript. So you might be able to share it, but you might have to wait six months or 12 months or even 24 months after publication before you're able to share that um, pre-published um, that author accepted manuscript, sorry, in an institutional repository or another kind of method of dissemination like that. However, um, it's true that some journals will allow you to request a change to their standard copyright agreements um, and they might allow you to keep all the rights to the document or they might allow you to um, remove that embargo period. Um, so it is something that authors can get into a conversation with the journal that they're looking to publish um, with about. And this kind of thing is growing at the moment um, due to changes with funder policy around um, the rights retention strategy. And this is something I'm going to speak a bit more about in a moment. 
um, but the kind of idea of authors taking a bit more control back on the copyright of their papers is something that is really increasing in the publishing landscape at the moment. In contrast, however, to when publishing in a subscription based journal, um, when you're publishing with an open access journal, usually the author will keep all the rights to their work um, and they would keep the rights to both the author accepted manuscript, but also the final published version of the work. And this is a really important benefit for authors in terms of when they're deciding where to publish, if they're looking to choose between an open access journal and a subscription based journal. Um, if you publish in an open access journal, you will keep the rights to your work. Um, it means that you can use it in other ways in the future um, and you um, as the author retain the rights. Um, when doing that, you when you sign the agreement with the journal, you're giving the journal a license to publish. Um, so you're allowing the journal to publish your work on your behalf as the rights holder. Um, hybrid journals um, in basic terms are kind of a mix between a subscription based um, publishing model and an open access publishing model. So hybrid journals are subscription based journals, but they have options for authors to pay an article processing charge, so to pay an individual fee to make their own papers available open access. Um, so some of the papers within the journal would be published um, behind a paywall um, and others would be published open access. So in terms of copyright, that means that if you're publishing, if you pay to publish your work um, open access within a hybrid journal, um, you retain the rights as you would with publishing in a fully open access journal and a Creative Commons license would be attached to the work. Um, and as I say, all the rights remain with the author. Whereas if you're publishing traditionally, so behind a paywall, and um, within that hybrid journal, it would be the same rules as publishing in a subscription journal. So the copyright would usually be transferred to the journal um, and you wouldn't retain the rights there over the final published version, usually just the author accepted manuscript version. So I've mentioned there about um, publishing in open access journals or publishing open access within a hybrid journal, and um, the fact that the author retains the rights and that a Creative Commons license would be placed on that work. Um, so what do I actually mean by a Creative Commons license? Um, so there are lots of different types of Creative Commons licenses um, and they kind of provide different layers of protection over your work, depending upon the ways that you would like your work to be reused in the future. So I've explained kind of the different levels of these Creative Commons licenses on the table on the screen. So I'm just going to run through them quickly now. Um, so one that I haven't got on the screen that I should also just mention is a Creative Commons Zero license, so a CC Zero license. Um, and that means that um, it can be completely free to reuse um, the work. It would be um, deemed in the public domain and anyone can use it in any way they see fit. Um, so this is very unusual for um, published academic work. It's not one that um, is usually spoken about by journals, not one that would stand to be allowed for this kind of thing. Um, so just to make you aware of that one, really. Um, the least restrictive license that tends to be put on published work, so in terms of open access journal articles um, and those kind of things, would be a CC BY license. Um, and this is also known as a Creative Commons attribution license. So basically what this license allows is that um, reuse, uh, full reuse of that work. Um, it can be adapted, it can be built upon, people can make money from it, um, all of those kind of things. Um, but the um, main thing that to remember is that the by the attribution means that the um, author or the, the rights holder over that paper or over that work um, must be attributed um, whenever there is reuse. So you could build upon it, do whatever you like with it, really, but you must say that it's based on this original work and attribute it. Um, so that's the main thing with, uh, with, with that license. The second one um, is a Creative Commons SA license, so um, share alike is what the SA stands for. Um, and this means that licensees are allowed to distribute the modified version of the work. So they can build upon the work, they can modify it, they can um, translate it, all of those kind of things. But when they share or distribute that um, adapted version of the work, they must share it under either the same or a not more restrictive license as the original work. So if the original work was also a CC by SA license, you could share it under a CC by SA license or a CC by license, 
but you couldn't share it, for example, under a copyright or rights reserved license because that's more restrictive than the original license. So it's meant to be um, a CC by SA license is meant to prevent others from effectively restricting your work more than you have um, restricted it yourself. Um, I've just seen in the chat that yes, I'd be more than happy to share the slides after the session and um, if that would be helpful. Um, the third license um, is a CC by NC license. So NC stands for non-commercial. And this means that um, the work that has been given this license can be reused, um, but it can only be reused for non-commercial non purposes. So no one can make money from reusing your work. So they can reuse one of your lesson plans, for example, if you were a teacher that you'd shared under a CC by NC license, your presentation slides. Someone couldn't use your presentation slides for a session that they're charging people to come for come to and um, because that would be a commercial purpose and the final most restrictive um, creative commons license is a cc by nd license and um, so nd stands for no derivatives so that means that people can reuse your work but they can't make any amendments to it so no modifications are allowed at all they can just reuse it as it is um, and they can share it openly um, but they can't make modifications to it um, this one I would say to use with caution because it does mean things like people couldn't create a translated version of your work so it might stop people using it in different countries um, or they couldn't convert it to um, different kind of formats and things so that one um, it can be used and it is used um, in certain situations but it is the most restrictive. The other thing to say is that all of these um, licenses are um, able to be combined. So these are the different kind of layers of the licenses, but you could say have a CC by SA NC license. So that would combine the share alike and the non-commercial, or you could have a CC by NC and D license. So that would um, combine the non-commercial and the no derivatives. So you can kind of combine the elements of the licenses in the way that suits the reuse of your work that you would like. Um, so what's important to remember with copyright licenses and assigning licenses to works is that they're not intended to be restrictors really, actually the Creative Commons licenses are intended to help reuse and help sharing of work, they're for open access resources, it's all about sharing and reuse, um, which is so important in academia, but it's just about sharing and reuse in a way that the rights holder, usually the author, is happy with, so it gives the author that element of control to effectively decide how their work is going to be used in the future. Okay, so that was a quick whistle stop tour of Creative Commons licenses. Um, we always encourage our researchers to get in touch with us if they come to making decisions about Creative Commons licenses and they're unsure about which to place on their work. And I think that is really important um, when it comes to copyright often the kind of confusion around these things can cause people to step away from it. But by engaging in conversation with our researchers about it, we help them um, to understand just what I was saying, that it can be helpful for them to think it all through. But what I wanted to speak to you about now um, is the right retention strategy, which I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, so at the moment in academia, funders, so research funders, are increasingly asking for open access um, publication is becoming a really important part of scholarly publishing, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and a key group of research funders known as Coalition S, um, which started out as a group of um, national funders and has now, a European funders, sorry, and has now gone international, more international, um, created a, plan, a kind of set of rules for um, researchers who are funded by their um, funding bodies um, called Plan S. Um, which you might have heard of, um, and Plan S stipulates that there are three ways that um, researchers who are funded by the Coalition S funder can make their work open access and still comply with their funder's policy. So there are three routes um, to complying, as I said. So if your research is funded by a Coalition S funder, you must either publish your work in a fully gold open access journal and make it open access that way, um, you can publish your work in a hybrid journal, um, but it must be um, covered by a transformative agreement, which is also known as a read and publish deal, which means that that um, hybrid journal is looking to transform to a fully gold open access journal within a set period of time. 
or the third way, which is what I want to talk to you about today, is to publish in a hybrid journal or a subscription journal. Um, the hybrid journal via this route doesn't need to be covered by a read and publish deal or a transformative agreement. Um, but if you're publishing in a subscription or a hybrid journal in that way, um, you must deposit the full text of your work in an institutional repository um, with a zero month embargo period. So this would be following the green route to open access, so self archiving your work, um, but there must be a zero month embargo period. And it's this final route to compliance with Plan S, um, which has become really important for copyright discussions, um, because there can often be a mismatch between journal policy and funder policy. So I mentioned earlier that um, usually when publishing in a subscription journal, um, authors sign over the copyright to the um, publisher or to the journal and um, they retain the rights on the author accepted manuscript, but there is often a term or condition that says that the author must um, can only share that author accepted manuscript um, openly after a certain amount of time, which is known as an embargo period. Um, so this prevents the author sharing their work um, straight away. So that would go against the Coalition S um, policy that there must be a zero month embargo period. So this mismatch between the journal and the funder is really complicated for authors. Um, it makes it really difficult for them to know what they should be doing because they've got their journal that they want to publish with on one side saying there must be an embargo period. And they've got their funder who's giving them the money for their research on the other side saying, no, there mustn't be an embargo period. And this has led um, to the rights retention strategy. So the rights retention strategy was developed by Coalition S, so this group of research funders who are demanding full and immediate open access on all of their funded research publications. And basically what the rights retention strategy is, is a statement, which you can see here on the slide, um, which authors put on their submission to the journal. Um, so when they first submit their work to the journal, they have this statement or one similar to this um, that says that they are, when, the, when that manuscript gets accepted by the journal, so on publication, um, they have put a Creative Commons Attribution Licence, a CC BY licence, on any author accepted manuscript that arises from the submission. So this is known as a prior licence. So they're saying to that journal, regardless of what your journal policy is, I'm putting a Creative Commons Attribution Licence on my author accepted manuscript. So whatever happens to this publication, however it's published, they have already put that CC BY license on the author accepted manuscript. Now, legally, this prior license, the fact that they've done that first, means that it cannot be overruled by any future licenses or any future agreements signed with the journal. So regardless of the journal policy in the future, this CC BY license on the author accepted manuscript can't be overruled. So in practice, what this means is that the authors while they might sign over the copyright to the final published version um, and give the and the journal can then go and publish that as normal, they retain full copyright on the author accepted manuscript. And not only do they retain the rights on it, they've put that CC BY license on that means they can share it openly, which in turn allows them to deposit the full text of the author accepted manuscript in an institutional repository immediately on publication. So it means that they can follow that third route to complying with Plan S. So this is a really important copyright development and it's showing kind of the funders and the authors, um, well, the authors via the funders really, um, kind of challenging those norms that have come with academic publishing from the publisher side of things. And it shows the authors kind of taking back some control of their own work. The problem with it is that journals could um, reject papers if they were to see this on the submissions. And this is something that we're kind of watching at the moment, and I say we in terms of the sector in general, not just us here at Essex, the sector in general all around Europe, all around the world really is watching this because it could be that journals start to reject papers if they see this. Um, lots of publishers have come out and said that they are against this as a way of um, allowing open access publication, but currently there haven't been many examples of people, of journals actively rejecting papers based on this. But it is something important to be aware of at the moment in the publishing landscape. Um, it's something that in the UK, and um, when the new UKRI policy comes starts in April of this year, is likely to have a bigger impact on our researchers. And I'm sure there are similar policies um, around Europe. So 
something to be aware of, something to keep an eye on, um, and a, a big development really in copyright in the terms of publishing. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that to you all today. Okay, but stepping away from um, journal article publishing and thinking a bit more about publishing monographs, um, usually um, when you're publishing a monograph, the publisher will ask the author to assign certain rights. Um, so when it comes to books, there's kind of three main ways that this might happen. And the details of the agreement with book publishers does tend to vary quite a lot from publisher to publisher and copyright agreements do tend to be quite long. Um, so it's important for authors of monographs to read through these um, before, before signing. But usually one of three things happens. So usually either the author assigns the copyright to the monograph publisher and the publisher now owns that work. And the author then usually gets royalties or payment based on how many of the books are sold. The second thing that might happen is that the author might keep the copyright um, to the work, but they give exclusive rights to the monograph publisher, which means that only that publisher can publish or disseminate their work. So the author retains the rights, um, but it can't be published with anyone else. Only that publisher can publish the work. Or the third version is that the publisher might give um, have non-exclusive rights. So again, the author might retain the copyright, um, but if there's non-exclusive rights, it means that more dissemination will be allowed. So they might be able to put the full text of that um, monograph within an institutional repository, for example. Um, but usually a full scale republishing wouldn't be allowed. It couldn't be like you could really have non-exclusive rights deals with multiple um, monograph publishers, but it means you yourself would be able to kind of disseminate it in other ways that weren't publishing um, usually if, if um, there was a non-exclusive rights deal. For open access monographs, um, which are less common at the moment, but are growing, um, it's quite similar to open access journals. So effectively, the author retains the copyright um, on their monograph, and they would then publish the work under one of those Creative Commons licenses that we looked at earlier. Um, and this means that the right retention strategy could become relevant here as well going forward. Um, it might be that authors try to retain rights on their um, author accepted manuscripts of monographs as well going forward if they were giving one of those other um, exclusive or non-exclusive kind of agreements with their publisher. Um, so again, something to watch there. Okay, so we've spoken quite a lot about publishing. And as I say, this does tend to be our focus here in the library when it comes to speaking to our researchers about copyright. Um, but we do also speak to our academic colleagues um, about how copyright affects teaching. So in terms of what can be used in teaching materials, so presentation slides and those kind of things, but also what can be included on online reading lists or in virtual learning environments. So here at Essex, we use Talis Aspire for our online reading list platform. Um, so if you hear me say Talis, that's what I'm referring to. I'll try to just say online reading list, but I might revert to brand. Um, and similarly for our virtual learning environment, we use Moodle. Um, so when it comes to teaching um, here at Essex and in lots of institutions, we have a copyright licensing agency license for higher education, so a CLA license. And this makes it easier for um, research for academics here to reuse content. So um, any institution that has a CLA license can reuse content much more broadly um, than people who don't sign one of these licenses. So for materials that are covered by the copyright licensing agency license, we can share up to 10% or one chapter of any work, um, whichever is greater. Um, and that kind of more refers to books. Um, but when it comes to journal articles, we can also share one article from one issue of each journal. Um, so these can be copied and shared. They can be uploaded to our online reading list platform, um, but they can only be shared with students or staff of the institution. So it must be for education within our institution. And we also have to report all digital copies made under this license um, to the copyright licensing agency. And we do that here by ensuring that all materials copied under the license are uploaded to our online reading list platform, which has a reporting mechanism through it. Um, so it enables us to know that we're being copyright compliant with all of the copying we're doing of teaching materials. 
Another license that is available for teaching um, is the ERA license for higher education, which is the Educational Recording Agency license. Um, and what's important with this license, again, is that it is for educational use only. Um, so the ERA license allows us to share programmes, so television programmes or clips of programmes or radio broadcasts to be shared on virtual learning environments or embedded in presentations. Um, but this can't be just for entertainment purposes. It must be for educational use. Um, it also, the material, um, similarly to the CLA license, the material we're sharing under the terms of this license also can't be shared on public platforms. So um, we stick just to our virtual learning environment and our online reading list platform. And we also here in the UK can make use of Box of Broadcasts or Bob, um, which is a kind of database that has many um, TV programmes and films that have been broadcast in the UK. Um, and by us having this educational recording agency license, it enables us to use this platform to share um, broadcast materials with our students. Um, so this is also another really important license for us um, in terms of reusing content for teaching. Um, where the sharing of materials for teaching isn't covered by one of these licenses, um, we do sometimes refer to copyright exceptions to enable us to um, share content more broadly for teaching. Um, there's lots of different exceptions to copyright law here in the UK, um, but the main ones that we refer to in UK law when um, we're talking about teaching is um, section 32. Um, so section 32 allows illustration for instruction. Um, and we think about this in terms of fair dealing. So um, if we're sharing materials under the terms of this license, um, it must be for non-commercial activity, it must be purely for instruction, and there must be sufficient acknowledgement um, for the work that we are sharing. As with everything really with copyright, this is somewhat open to interpretation. Um, in the past, for example, there's been discussions about the non-commercial elements of this. Um, so non-commercial seems quite straightforward, um, but where we are charging students for their education, and um, there have been some debates that is higher education actually a commercial activity? And um, the consensus in the UK has been found that no, it isn't a commercial activity and we're not making profit. Um, it doesn't work quite in that way. So um, it is the general agreement that these exceptions can be used. Um, also, the for instruction element of this um, exception has been debated in the past. Um, as to whether it just refers to in-class materials. Um, but the general agreement is that online platforms such as online reading lists um, and virtual learning environments are a really essential part of teaching and are therefore just an extension of the classroom. And therefore we can, again, um, interpret those scenarios as um, for instruction. What I wanted to highlight really with this today was though that um, using copyright exceptions um, is quite an important part of thinking about teaching and copyright. Um, we do want to be able to share resources with our students as much as possible. Um, and copyright should really be an enabler of creativity rather than a restrictor on it. Um, so, but we do have to ask ourselves some standard questions when we're making these kind of decisions. And I guess, um, regardless of what copyright laws you might have in your, um, where you are, really the kind of general things to think that we always think about is, is the material that we're using directly relevant to what is being taught? Um, if the answer is yes, that tends to be a good argument for using it. Are we reproducing an unreasonable proportion of the original? So we want to make sure we're only ever reproducing what is needed and not reproducing so much that we could damage the interests of the copyright owner in some way. So we're not doing some kind of copying or sharing of resources as a replacement of purchasing the resource. Um, we would always own a copy ourselves in the library first. Um, but also if it was became a huge amount that we were copying, we wouldn't do that because it wouldn't be, um, it would be an unreasonable proportion, it would be a replacement for purchasing the original copies and it would therefore be damaging the interests of the copyright owner. As I say, we also always acknowledge the author and the source um, to make sure that everyone who is looking at that copy can get back to the original. And usually what we really say is that a good rule of thumb is to put yourself in the position of the owner of the copyright and think whether you would be happy with your work being used in that way if you'd written that work or if you owned the copyright to that work. Um, and usually we find that's the best way to kind of answer these sorts of questions. Okay, um, so that's enough kind of just 
plain talking from me, I think. Um, so what I want to do now is to run a um, poll using Zoom. Hopefully this is going to work um, to answer some kind of common copyright questions that we get asked. Um, so I'm going to run the polls individually and give you a little bit of time to answer. I won't leave them open for too long, just in the interest of time. But if you can vote for each one, um, that would be great. And then we'll have a bit of a discussion. If you have any thoughts um, on the questions after you voted or um, as we go through, please do put them in the chat um, and I'll keep an eye on that as well. It'd be great to hear kind of your reasonings behind the answers. But so for each question, um, we're going to just have three answers. So the question is, do I own the rights to my PhD? Now, this one might vary depending on institution. So we might get some different um, answers here, um, but it'll be interesting to see um, what the kind of general consensus is here. Um, and I think I'll give you all um, maybe uh, 30 seconds at the start to answer. Um, might take it down to 20 depending on time. Okay. So we had quite a mixture, apologies to those who didn't get a chance to vote, um, but mostly we had uh, yes. So yes, you do own the rights to your PhD. Some people had it depends, which I think is fair because it does tend to depend by institution. Um, and a few people had no, which may of course be the, the case where you are. Um, here at Essex, um, our PhD students do own the rights to their PhD. So they own the rights to their thesis. Um, because we see our PhD students as students. So um, all of our students own the rights to all of their works while they're studying here. But as I say, it can, um, can vary um, based on institution. Okay, uh, the next one is, um, can I use the images I don't own in my PhD thesis? So what do you think? Okay. So um, we had a lot of it depends again this time. So 64% of people that responded said it depends. Um, so I would say that in your PhD thesis, what we would advise is that yes, you can use images you don't own in your PhD thesis, um, because the way that um, PhD theses are shared here at Essex is that they're not considered as published works. Um, and there is a copyright exception in the UK for education and research. That means you can use a reasonable amount of a third party material um, within um, materials that are being created just for the purpose of education and research, which a PhD thesis that isn't officially published would be. Um, however, it must be properly cited. But with the it depends, um, that might lead us on to our next question, um, because um, the next question is, can I include the images I use in my research in my publication? Okay, I'll give you a couple of seconds more for this one. Okay, so we had a real mix again here, but lots of it depends and some yeses. Um, so we would say it depends. So as I kind of hinted at on the last question, publication is different purely just for research. So once you publish a work, so for example, um, in the last question, we were talking about a PhD thesis just for research. If you went on to publish that PhD, or publish any kind of research you've done, that's when you really have to think about the third party copyright materials that you've used. Um, so the answer is yes, you can include images that you've used in your research and your publication, but you must have either, they must either have been open access um, images, which allowed reuse in a certain way. So they might have been CC0 images, which means they're in the public domain and you can use them, or they might have been CC BY images, so you've put attribution in there for you could use them, or CC BY SA, so you've shared them in by the same or a less restrictive license, so you can use them. All of those kind of layers we went through earlier. If they weren't open access images, 
um, what you would have needed to do is sought permission from the copyright owner. Um, so that might be getting in touch with the publisher if it was an image that was found in a textbook, for example, um, and asking them if you could use the image or if it was from another researcher's work that had been shared in a subscription journal, um, you might get in touch with the publisher of that journal or you might try to get in touch with the author and ask whether they retain the rights over that image because it might be that um, they've published a work in a subscription journal and signed the copyright over to the publisher but they might have retained the rights themselves over those images um, and I'll come on to that in a in a bit um, in a few more questions um, but the important thing to remember with this one is yes you can reuse Im you can include images figures graphs all of those kind of things that you've used in your research in your publication but this was the first point I was making at the real beginning of the presentation you have to think about the third party copyright clearance in these situations and you also have to be aware that there could be payment involved for clearing copyright and um, for these kind of materials and um, so do keep that in mind and also make sure to keep track of the copyright licenses and copyright owners of images, graphs, figures, tables, whatever you might be using from third party sources in your research. And um, because if you've just put it in your work and it becomes important to your work and you then can't trace back to the copyright owner, um, it can be a real headache. Um, and that is something that we've had people come to us about before. Okay, the next question. Um, so, can I reuse content from work I have published before? So if you've published a work previously, can you use um, aspects of that um, work that you've published before in your new work? Okay. So um, we had a small amount of no's um, and then a real split between yes and it depends. You might notice a trend here. Um, there's quite a lot of it depends when it comes to copyright. And I would say that this is one of them. So it, it would depend. Do you still own the copyright of that previous work? So if you still own the copyright to that previous work, then yes, you can reuse content from your previous work. And um, you just need to make sure to self cite where needed. Um, if you don't own the copyright to the previous work, then you would need to clear the rights with the copyright owner just as you would with a work that you hadn't written. So just like on the previous question, um, if it was third party material where you yourself don't own the copyright, you would go and get copyright clearance. You would have to do that on even if it was your own previous work, if you no longer own the copyright for it. And again, just to highlight, I am talking about kind of substantial work here. So images, tables, graphs, and um, large passages of text you want to um, reuse not talking about individual quotations or kind of using concepts and ideas that would follow the standard just referencing um, but I'm talking about using substantial works from previous copyrighted works and um, if you still own the copyright you could use it and um, make sure still to give your own previous work attribution if you um, don't own it anymore you'd need to clear the copyright in the same way or again if you yeah, no, that would be the same. If you'd published it open access, you would still own the copyright. You can see even I have to think around the th scenarios through my head. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of thinking when it comes to copyright. Okay, um, so the next one. Can I reuse figures from my published work in future work? So I have somewhat just given you the answer to this one on the previous question, but there is a reason that I've highlighted separately. Okay, so um, we've got yes and mostly it depends. So yes, it would be it depends um, based on, again, the same thing. So do you still own the copyright to those figures? Um, the reason I wanted to highlight this one, though, is that a really good tip for um, figures, graphs, those kind of things that you create, even if you're going to publish um, in a subscription journal or publish a monograph, that means that you no longer retain the rights on that full work. When you're doing your research and you're creating figures or tables or graphs or anything like that, you can upload these figures to Figshare 
um, which is a website that allows you to um, upload individual figures. So not whole published works. Effectively, you almost publish um, figures and things like that onto a website called Figshare and you assign a license to that figure. So um, I've done this myself in the past. I've created some um, kind of figures or some kind of smaller works, not fully published articles or anything, um, uploaded them to Figshare, put a Creative Commons attribution license on those figures, which then means that if I come to write anything in the future using those figures, um, I would retain, I would be the rights holder on those figures. So I would put, say, a CC BY license on those. And then when I publish that journal article, say, that uses those figures in there, that figure almost becomes a third party resource within that work. So the copyright owner of the article wouldn't own the copyright to that figure because I've already put a Creative Commons license on that individual figure. And that means you can then use those things in any of your work or your teaching slides or um, anything you want to build upon those with in the future. You can do that freely without having to worry about contacting the publisher back because you've retained the copyright on those on that kind of figure or table or whatever it might be. So that's a really helpful thing to remember if Figshare isn't something that you are aware of. Okay, um, we've got a couple more of these to go. So um, these ones are a bit more focused on teaching. So can I put my reading materials on a virtual learning environment? Um, this might vary again by institution, um, but I'll let you guys uh, have a go at answering this. So I'm talking about kind of if you've made a scan of a chapter from a book, for example, can you put that on a virtual learning environment? Okay, um, so most people have said yes, um, and some people have said it depends. Um, so I won't give you a hard and fast answer on this one because um, it will vary by institution, so it's a bit unfair. Here at Essex, though, the answer would be no. Um, so actually, all of our reader materials must be put on our online reading list platform rather than our virtual learning environment. And that's because where we make copies under the terms of our um, copyright licensing agency license, um, we have to report all of the scans that we do, all of the copies that we make um, to the copyright licensing agency. And we do this via our online um, reading list platform. Um, so we have to upload all of our reading material scans to our online um, reading list platform rather than our virtual learning environment. There is a way that our um, academics can embed their online reading list within their um, virtual learning environment pages. Um, so from the perspective of our students, they probably still see that they're accessing them via the virtual learning environment. But for our academics, um, we have to get them to put them on our online reading list platform. This is one that we spend a lot of time talking to our academics about to try to understand and um, because it is really important that all of that copying is reported to the copyright licensing agency. OK, um, I wrote the chapter so I can do whatever I like with the full text. And um, so if you wrote the chapter, you can um, put it online, you can put it on your reading list, you can put it in a virtual learning environment um, because you wrote it. What do we think? Okay, so we've got no, um, and a couple of it depends, and a couple of yes. Um, so I would say with this one, it depends, um, because it depends whether you own the copyright for it. The majority of the time, because of the way monographs are published, it's unlikely that you will own the copyright to your chapter. Um, but if you had published um, the chapter open access, um, then you would be able to use the full text, um, assuming that the agreement that you'd signed allowed you to do that. Um, but um, as you have all kind of said, mostly the answer would be no. The fact that you've written it often, sadly, perhaps doesn't mean that you can share it in whichever way you like, especially if you've signed the copyright over to the publisher. OK, this next one, again, thinking about teaching, really, um, it's freely available online. So the resource is freely available online so I can share it with my students. OK, 
Okay, so this one, and um, we've got a real mixture of results, and I would say that kind of makes sense because this is somewhat of a grey area. And actually, this is something we still ask ourselves um, here quite a lot. Um, it seems silly to restrict students reading um, materials that are freely available online because, of course, they could have just found it themselves. Um, but as we all know, not all materials that are freely available online are legitimate. Um, so if something has been illegally uploaded, here at Essex, we don't openly direct our students to sources that have clearly been illegally uploaded onto the internet. But we also acknowledge that we can't police the internet. Um, we can make sure our academics are sharing things in a copyright compliant way within, the, um, within our institution. In terms of everything that's uploaded on the internet, of course, that is completely outside of the scope of an institution or of higher education in general. Um, but we think that we have kind of a responsibility um, to not encourage our students towards illegitimate sources um, where it does get problematic as if that is somewhat of the only relevant resource um, that people want to use. Um, but in general, um, if something's been legally uploaded, we don't um, openly direct our students to the source. OK, um, a few more to go. So I only want to use a few pages, so it's fine to scan and share. So I just want to use a few pages of a book so I can scan it and share it with my students. Okay, so we've got another mix. Um, here in the UK, I wouldn't want to speak for um, copyright law in other countries. Um, this can be a legitimate point um, as under copyright exceptions. Um, one of the exceptions does um, kind of say that up to 5% of any work can be used and um, can be shared for educational purposes, regardless of the publisher imposed restrictions. So 5% is very small. Um, and this is seen to come under the realms of kind of fair dealing that you could if you owned a book, you could scan 5% of the work and share it with your student. The sticking point with this is we still do have to be able to source the material from a legitimate source. So we would still have to own that book or one of our academics would have to own that book. Um, it needs to be from a legitimate source to be able to do that under the copyright exception. As I say, it will vary um, depending on which country's copyright laws you are using. OK, we've got two to go. Um, this one is, it's very old, so copyright doesn't apply. Okay. So majority here have said yes, um, which can be a legitimate point because, um, again, in UK copyright law, 70 years after an author's death, um, written works in the UK are no longer copied by co copyright law, no longer covered, sorry, by copyright law. Um, but bear in mind, international laws do differ, um, so it will vary by country to country. And also the rules on this do vary for other materials. So, for example, in the UK, Broadcasts are protected for 50 years from the date the broadcast was made. Um, so um, television programmes, news reports, all of those kind of things will be protected by copyright for 50 years after the date the broadcast was made. Um, when these kind of copyright laws expire, um, so when materials are no longer covered by copyright, they tend to be in the public domain. So then you would be able to use resources. But the way this question is worded is a bit um, to say so copyright doesn't apply. Um, there's lots of different layers to copyright. So, for example, um, the texts of Jane Austen are not covered by copyright anymore in UK copyright law. However, the Penguin second edition of Pride and Prejudice would be covered by the copyright law of that text of that book. So the original words wouldn't be under copyright anymore, but the kind of the typesetting, the print, all of those kind of things would be covered by the copyright of then when that edition was published. Um, so there's lots of kind of layers to this. Um, to keep in mind, so it's not quite as simple as it might seem on first look. Okay, final one um, is a bit of a, um, I won't say an easy one, but one that we sometimes get told by our academics, um, no one will know, um, and it will help my students, so it's fine to use that resource.
Okay. So we've got a, a clear majority here, so no, this wouldn't be okay. Um, as I said earlier, try to think about if you had written the work, um, you would want others to respect the work and use it in a way that you were happy with. Um, it can also affect people's metrics in terms of things like downloads and views on journal articles, for example, those kind of things. Um, if you were just downloading a PDF and emailing it to all of your students, for example. Also on an institutional level, so um, working in institutions like universities, we have to manage the risk within the institution. So individual risks for um, people to share resources between each other would be low, really, um, but there could be serious reputational and financial ramifications at a university level if there was lots of sharing of resources in a non-copyright compliant way going on. Um, but what we always try and highlight to our academics um, and our researchers is that we do understand that uh, um, complying with copyright legislation can sometimes be um, quite frustrating, um, but we always try to do everything we can to allow our students to access as many resources as we can. And as I said earlier, we always try to see copyright as kind of protection for authors um, and enablers of sharing in a way that um, authors are happy with rather than a restrictor on use, if that makes sense. Um, so that's the way that we try to view, to view copyright. Okay, um, so that was everything that I wanted to speak to you about today. Thank you for being so engaged with that um, activity at the end. I hope that was helpful for you. Um, if anyone has any follow up questions that they would like to email me about, um, please do feel free to use the email address on the screen there. And that will come to myself and my colleague um, within our research support team, and we'd be happy to answer questions there. Um, I could, also, I think, I'm also sticking around for a Q and A session coming up after a short break, and um, so I'll be there as well. Um, I'll just stop sharing my screen now. I thank thank you all for listening. Thank you ever so much, Hannah. That was that was fantastic. And thank you for our audience being so engaged um, in the poll. I do hope you've learned a lot. Uh, but as we've promised, we do have breaks. Um, and I think everyone um, can get a cup of coffee, um, stretch our legs for a little bit, just a 10 minutes break. We'll, um, we'll see you back at 10 minutes past 11. Uh, we do have some questions on the Padlet. Please feel free to write more questions. We have Hannah as well joining us uh, for the Q&A question. Thank you once again, Hannah. Um, and we'll speak with you in just a little bit. And there's a lot of different types of data collections. So you can see the ones listed here. A lot of it is quantitative types of data, um, partially because reusing data within uh, quantitative projects is, is a little bit more of a, a dumb thing, but um, you can get qualitative and mixed methods data as well. Um, in terms of the types of quantitative data, it might be a cross-sectional uh, cross or longitudinal survey micro data, could be international macro data. Um, the census counts as well, that might be as micro data or sometimes it's aggregated. Um, it could be administrative data or business micro data. In terms of where the data comes from, 
often it comes from official agencies. So this could be sort of central government or collaborative kind of international efforts to collect um, information about the population. Um, that's where the bulk of certainly the, the quantitative data comes from. You also have some, you know, kind of running uh, international statistical time series, research institutions um, may, may deposit data as standard. Um, you also get quite a bit from individual academics. So certainly within the UK, there's data policies that require anybody who's receiving taxpayer funded grants to then deposit their data at the end of their research projects. It's common in other countries throughout Europe as well. Um, sometimes it's not a requirement, but an encouragement. I think in terms of, of that kind of requirement, UK is, is a little bit of a, of a more extreme example. So um, it varies a little bit by country, but often when it's, when it's taxpayer funded, there may be a requirement to deposit. It might come from third parties like market research agencies. And then of course, there's always public records and historical sources. So that includes things like the census, but there might also be an effort to digitize, for example, government papers that are released um, and those may then become a, a data collection. Where do you find secondary data? Um, usually through a data catalog. Um, you, you can sort of, you know, um, find it in sort of the, uh, uh, well, third party or more open kind of repositories online, but there are kind of national archives. There's also um, more thematic archives. So if you're lo looking for a specific type of data, or if you're looking for a very specific um, type of theme within your data, like migration, for example, there's always going to be some archives that might attune specifically to that kind of data. Um, a lot of these archives feed into the SESDA catalog, um, so that's a good point of call to go to, um, but they may well also have their own data catalogs. Um, it's a bit of hit or miss sometimes how it is working through some of those data, uh, data catalogs. Some of them are kind of, you know, data listings and they're, they're not always easy to navigate. Um, but something like this as the data catalog is very easy. You write in a search term and it tells you which, which uh, data collections um, meet uh, the, those search requirements. When you actually get to a data uh, set that you're interested, what does it then look like? Well, if you stumble across something in, in, um, in, your, in your search, um, and let's say it came from the UK data service, you would be able to usually download a zipped file. When you opened up that zip file, it would contain the data set, and often it can also contain some documentation, just some additional information about the methods of, of the uh, original uh, research project. And in this particular example of a zipped file, this RTF folder is where the data sits, and that's because it's a qualitative collection. So RTF is a, is a Word document. So you open that up and magically there's all your data files, all nicely organized. And when you actually open those up, um, you know, they can be quite insightful. There are some legacy collections, it's, it's probably worth noting, where they may be scanned or handwritten, um, and it might require a little bit of work on your behalf to sort of clean the data, um, is the terminology we use. So for example, this is a survey from Affluent Worker, and it was a, a you know, sort of mix of uh, close-ended and open-ended questions. Um, and these are scanned in as PDFs um, because they were, they were conducted at a time when they didn't have lovely things like SPSS or, you know, sort of these, some of these online surveys that you can do now. So when you start looking at those, you'll find some of them have been, uh, some of the open-ended questions have been uh, digitized and actually transcribed. Um, so somebody's done a bit of work, somebody got a, a bit of money to be able to do this work and clean it up further. Sometimes the data sets also have their own interface that you can work from. So for example, OECD data, if you're interested in that, this one is looking at foreign-born population within Europe. 
um, you can kind of work on the screen and start filtering and, and seeing what some of that looks like, but you can also download. Um, and those downloads can be an SPSS form or an Excel form. Um, there's a number of sort of larger international um, uh, uh, survey data that, that is uh, available like this with its own interface. The GSS, the General Social Survey in, in the US is a similar one where they, they've got their own interface that you would work from and then you can download from there um, once you've kind of filtered to the right variables that you want in the data set. And in terms of what the data can look like, I mean, it's, it's only limited to what your imagination would be um, and what kind of data you can collect. So again, it, it could be something that's handwritten and scanned in. It could be images, audio files, video files. Audio and video tend to be larger files. So um, often you'll see that those are transcribed and then made available in that sort of way. Um, but there are some archives that specifically hold um, audio uh, and, and video as well. Um, as well as things that you're probably more used to seeing like Word document files or SPSS files. And in terms of how this data is then reused, um, just, to, just to kind of wrap this up, but um, you know, we've got a good example of Mike Savage's work um, who used that affluent worker that I, that I had previously and I said, oh, somebody got some money to digitize it. Part of that was um, Mike Savage's work um, where he looked not only at sort of the, the past uh, class calculations that was done using that survey, but then he made headline news and they were able to collect more information and build upon that. Um, so it's a nice case of, of not only reuse of the data, but then extending it as well and collecting a bit more data. And I just wanted to end on a bit of note about terminology. Um, so when we talk about secondary data, I'm very cognizant of the word secondary, um, or if we talk about secondary analysis. Um, and I just wanted to point out as well that, you know, there, there are different attitudes toward um, data reuse and, and specifically secondary data. So certainly there are some areas where this is more common and it's just kind of accepted um, that you would reuse data. And then there's other areas where there's a little bit more of a debate about what's the best way of doing this. And Libby Bishop has written a very interesting um, article about secondary versus primary uh, data collection and uh, reuse. And she's kind of said, well, you know, it's important that we're cognizant of some of this terminology. And she prefers the um, word data reuse instead. So you might hear that used interchangeably. And part of that gets away from this inherent hierarchy of primary and secondary. And she says, actually, when you think about secondary analysis or secondary data, you know, it's its own method in and of itself, and it has its own ethical considerations uh, to make and methodological considerations to make. Um, so she's a big proponent of saying, you know, if we're creating this kind of hierarchy, let's not do that. And instead, we'll use the word data reuse. Um, so you do see that a little bit more. And certainly secondary data um, use where it's not been as much of a tradition is certainly seen a huge explosion, certainly in terms of the number of publications um, and the number of data downloads that we have at the UK Data Service. Um, so for example, in qualitative traditions, you know, not as common in the past, but absolutely much more common now. Um, so it was just a final note to think about as well, some of that academic debate about how to call it and what are those ethical and methodological considerations. Okay, and I think I'm turning over to Hina now to kind of dive into more detail, um, or are there any questions to take? Thank you ever so much, Maureen, um, uh, for the short introduction to secondary data. Uh, we now pass over to Hina for a 25 minutes presentation covering the main issues um, in secondary data use. I'm putting it again in the chat, the Padlet for questions, ask them directly in the chat as well. Um, all of us will be available in the Q&A session after Hina's presentations. Hina, now, now to you. 
Thank you, Christina. Um, in this session, I will focus on intellectual property rights in the context of research, and I'll talk you through to the two most relevant IP rights, um, copyright and database rights. Uh, that includes copyright notices, copyright and personal data. I'll also discuss what is meant by public domain and often works. And I'll show you some common copyright questions asked by the researchers collated by UK Copyright Service, and they are very useful. And finally, um, I'll go through some best practice tips. Sorry, I have a problem again with automatically changing slides. The intellectual property plays an essential role in both the research and teaching functions of universities and public research institutions. Um, we are focusing intellectual property rights in the context of research in the session. So uh, intellectual property rights affect the way both you and others can use yours and others research data. And these issues should be considered at the outset of any research project. University and public research institutions employ students, visiting researchers and outside collaborators all create IP rights in the performance of their research or teaching duties. This IP intellectual property rights may take the form of confidential technical information protected by trade secrets, patent inventions, designs, software programs, original written works, diagrams, lectures and presentations, and it can be the output of many other types of creative endeavors. So the question is, who owns the rights to these works and results? I, I remember that there is a question in the, uh, on the Padlet regarding this. So the answer is not always easy or clear. It may vary from one country to another, from one institution to another, and within a given institution, depending on the type of creator, for example, employees, students, visiting researchers, and outside collaborators. It also depends on the nature of the. It also depends on the nature of the work being done, such as invention, copyright work, confidential technical data, design, etc., or the creator's use of resources or funds of the institutions, and sponsors, and the circumstances of creation whether work is created by an individual or as part of a collaborative effort. So as I said earlier, that rules on IP ownership will depend on national law and individual institutions policies, but generally these are more or less similar. Some of the important points to remember are many universities or research centers claim ownership of any intellectual property that is generated by academic staff in the course of their employment. And also when intellectual property is created using substantial institutional resources. But again, it may vary from country to country. So in terms of the students, most universities recognize as a general practice that students who are not employees of the university own the IP rights in the works they produce purely based on knowledge received from lectures and teaching. However, there may be some circumstances where ownership has to be shared or assigned to the university or a third party. So typically these include sponsored students, students working on research, thesis or publications in collaboration with the academic staff. Research funders may also wish to exert some claim over rights Although in most cases, IP rights are attributed to the researchers, unless an output becomes commercially viable. So if a university research project has commercial collaborators, there may be joint IP rights in the research outputs, which are best handled via legal contracts or consortium agreements. Researchers should clarify ownership of rights relating to research data sources for both primary and secondary data being used before embarking upon research. So this in turn will help determine how those data can be published and accessed in the future. So the best practice is to find out the ownership as soon as possible. How you can find out who owns the rights? It is not that hard to find out. If you are affiliated to any university or research center, there should be a staff in there who deals with a 
um, with these sort of issues. Um, so you can find it looking at the, or you can find it looking at the applicable national intellectual property law IP policies of the universities and the individual contractual agreements among the university um, creators and sponsors, or as a last resort, you can seek legal advice to be compliant. Because failure to do so can cause serious issues for the future uses of your research, such as its uh, dissemination, any future related research project or profit associated with it. Two most relevant types of Two, um, the two most relevant types of rights in the research context are copyrights and database rights. I'll go through both of these. Copyright is an intellectual property right assigned automatically to the works creator. It prevents unauthorized copying and publishing of an original work. Copyright cannot be taken away without consent and cannot be abused without the possibility of legal action. So the creator is automatically the first copyright owner, unless there is a contract that assigns copyright differently, or there is a written transfer of copyright signed by the copyright owner. It can vary nationally, but um, under the UK Copyright Designs and Patent Act 1988, copyright applies to original literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works sounds, recordings, films, broadcasts, or cable programs, and the typographical arrangement of publications, databases. And the most important thing here is um, to remember is facts cannot be copyrighted, and there is no copyright in ideas as such or unrecorded speak. Many kinds of data created as part of a research project are subject to the same rights as literary or artistic work, these might include text, maps, or audiovisual recordings or information that is arranged in a database structure. Such items require um, IP rights, such as copyright when they are created. This gives the rights owner control over the exploitation of their work, um, such as the right to copy and adapt the work, the right to rent or lend it, right to communicate it to the public, right to license and distribute. The rights need to be taken into account when creating, using, and sharing data. Uh, most research outputs, including spreadsheets, publications, textual files, reports, and computer programs, fall under literary work and are therefore protected by copyright. So for copyright to apply, the work must be original and fixed in a material form, for example, written or recorded. And uh, as I said earlier, right needs to be, to be taken into account when creating, using, and sharing. In the context of research, copyright offers protection to a researcher. It prevents people from copying your work, sharing your work with others, using your work in public as their own, modifying your work without acknowledging you or putting it on the internet as their own. Similar to the IP right, some points to bear in mind in terms of copyright ownership, there is a joint copyright when a work has two or more authors or multiple research institutions are involved or research data or material is derived from existing data. It does not matter if existing data is free, borrowed or purchased. Information in the public domain is not free to use. It is under copyright to the creator. In addition, participants own the copyright of their words in an interview. So copyright includes both economic and moral, moral rights. Essentially, economic rights involve the right to control the distribution of a work. In other words, a copyright owner can stop anyone from copying or using a work without permission, including, for example, by translating it, repro reproducing it, performing it, or broadcasting it. Exactly how the owner enforces these rights will depend on the national laws of the country concerned but countries often provide a mixture of civil and criminal penalties for copyright infringement. Copyright also includes certain moral rights of the creator, including among others, the right to be acknowledged as the author of a work and to prevent it from being altered in a way that 
that might damage the creator's reputation. So generally, nomic rights can be transferred and divided. Copyright owners may choose to give away their work for free or to let other people use it freely based on certain conditions. For example, they may allow use based on standard creative common licenses. They may give or sell the rights to someone who then becomes the new owner or if a copyright owner dies, their successors or hires will in inherit their economic rights. It is very common for rights to be transferred. For example, book authors, mu music composers and recording artists often license or assign rights to publishers in exchange for payments known as royalties. Um, in many countries, creators can license or assign their rights to collective management organizations, which will monitor how works are used and collect payments from users on their creators' behalf. On the other hand, in some countries, moral rights cannot be traded or transferred, but a creator may sometimes agree to waive or refrain from exercising them. Um, now I'll talk you through to the database rights. Uh, as this is also relevant in this context. Um, rights in databases are treated differently. If information is structured in a database, the structure acquires a database right alongside the copyright in the content of the database. So according to the UK's um, copyright and rights in databases regulations, a database is a collection of independent works arranged in a systematic way. Database rights protect and reward the creation and arrangement of a, a database. So a database may be protected by both copyright and database rights for database right to apply. The database must be the result of substantial intellectual in investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the content in an original manner. So, Simply entering facts into a spreadsheet would not count as substantial effort, but translating or synthesizing and coding information from multiple sources probably would. Um, the author's time, scale, and labor would need to be directed to the selection and arrangement of the database over and above gathering the information. So the database right is an automatic right, and it protects databases against the unauthorized extraction and reuse of the contents. Uh, while most database rights are protected for 15 years from the date of creation or publication, for some complex databases, the structure itself can be categorized as a literary work. Even if it is, if its contents are of a visual nature um, and therefore track 70 years copyright similar to other literary material. Um, if a researcher uses parts of data from a database, as well as the structure in which those data are held to create another data set, they should obtain explicit copyright and database right clearance before they publish the data. So database rights were first introduced by EU database directive and eligible databases receive protection in all EU countries and including the UK when it was a member of the EU. The UK implemented the directive through the copyright and rights in databases regulations. So since leaving the EU, the reciprocal recognition for new database rights between the EU and UK has ceased. Uh, however, the UK and EU agreed to continue the reciprocal recognition where those rights had already been avoid, uh, awarded. Um, so UK databases created before 1st January 2021 will continue to be protected in the EU and vice versa. So it is essential to claim database rights that it should be a result of substantial um, intellectual, sorry. Um, it is essential to claim database rights that it should be a result of substantial intellectual investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the context in an um, original manner. So just keep that in mind. Um, in addition, like copyright or IP rights, database rights are also automatic. You do not have to apply for it. The structure where the information is sitting acquires a database right and the content acquires the copyright protection. 
So it is a possibility that in a database copyright or database both applies or none of these apply. So the duration of copyright depends on the type of work. There may be differences at the country level, which will be discussed tomorrow. And the duration normally ranges from 50 years to 70 years. On the contrary, duration of the database right is 15 years in majority of the countries. So the economic rights within copyright only last for a limited period. The so-called term of copyright, once this term has expired, a work enters into the public domain, meaning it is free for anyone to use, while moral rights are term limited in some countries and perpetual in others. So, sorry. I think the slides were skipped. So when copyright um, in our work comes to an end, the work is set to enter the public domain. In order to establish our work, uh, in order to establish if a work is in the public domain, you should ask yourself two questions. Who created the work? When did the creator die? If the creator died more than 70 years ago, his or her works should be in the public domain and can be used in the creation of new work. For example, if you want to create a video game based on a play that was written in 18th century, which is more than 70 years ago, you can create a game based on that play without the need to ask for permission. So when dealing with public domain materials, you need to keep in mind three important rules. Different copyright rules apply in different countries, and that's the most important rule. So the rules that matter are the rules of your own country. Therefore, the fact that a work is in the public domain in, a, in another country like the US does not necessarily mean that it is in the public domain in the UK as well. Um, a reproduction or recording of a public domain work often qualifies for a copyright itself. That is a piece of music and a sound recording of that piece Um, of that piece um, of music are two different types of work with two different copyrights. Therefore, the fact that a musical composition is in the public domain does not mean that a recording of that music is in the public domain as well. So if you want to use that composition, that composition or any composition in your video, you need to find a sound recording of that composition that is free to you. Um, a new adaptation or version of a public domain work will be the copyright protected, even though the original work is not. So sometimes when researchers wish to share research data by, by, by publishing or disseminating it, all the right holders need to be identified and the necessary copyright permissions be granted for data to be shared. There are instances where one or more of the right Holders are unknown or cannot be located. Such works are known as often works. So if you want to use a work within copyright, you must, with a few exceptions, seek the permission of the relevant right holder who may include the creators or publishers. It is not normally possible to reproduce the work if the right holders cannot be identified. Um, in order to establish if a work is an often work, you need to carry out a diligent search by consulting the appropriate sources for the category of works and other protected subject matter in question. The diligent search shall be carried out prior to the use of the work. The procedure of carrying out this search is more or less similar everywhere, but make sure you check it if there are any country specific differences. Um, before carrying out a diligent search, you should first consider the following issues as a, it would be a very time consuming process. Um, is it really necessary to use the work? Is whether this work is under copyright duration? Who are the right holders? Where did you find the work? And is it already found to be an orphan? So, a copyright notice is a statement attached to work that identifies the copyright owner of the work. I'm sure all of you are aware how it looks like. Um, the aim 
is just to make it clear that the work is subject to copyright. It also helps in identifying who the copyright holder um, is in case needs to be contacted for permission to share the content or of course to deter infringement or plagiarism. Um, something a little bit about copyright and personal data. There may be other arising legal issues, for example, where personal data is concerned, not only the permission for, from the person who has created the work is required, um, but permission from all the people whose personal data is in the work is required as well, if you plan to share it, share your data. So, if you plan to use secondary data, sorry. What, what's going on here. Um, I have um, added some uh, useful questions that UK Copyright Service have been asked by the researchers and they have added on to their website. So you can, I just let you read quickly. So you can see that these are the useful questions that answers many, most of your questions you have in your mind. You can read these uh, when you get the slides afterwards. So if you plan to use secondary data, always ensure that you consider these questions, who the copyright holder of the data set is. Can you, can you use these and in what way? Are you allowed to archive and publish them in a data repository? If not, you may need to seek for further permission to distribute material you do not own. Um, yeah, so if you do not get permission, then you need to remove the copyright uh, variable or material before publishing or sharing. So that's all, thank you for listening. Over to you, Christina. Thank you ever so much, Hina. Uh, that was fantastic. And we keep having questions coming onto the Padlet. I see there are a couple of people that, that have to go. No, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Um, again, we try to um, put in the presentation as much information as possible, because as we've seen throughout the day, uh, when it comes to copyright, either for publications, for data, for teaching purposes, there are so many things to bear in mind. Um, and I think one important thing is to always check with the institution you're coming from as well. Uh, but we'll see that tomorrow, we're actually covering the international context as well. Um, and also social media, uh, because that's a very hot topic when it comes to copyright. Uh, so what I'll do now, as promised, I will stop the recording. Um, we are starting our Q&A session. Um, so um, thank you all ever so much for joining day one of Copyright Issues in Secondary Day by Youth. Um, today, we have been looking at the history of copyright. We've introduced some basic copyright concepts like um, copyright in publications, teaching, research data, secondary data, key concepts and terminology, which are very important, especially when we're working with secondary data. And we've also looked at the main copyright issues in secondary data use. And I would like to thank you all once again for completing the Padlet. It's clear the Padlet is where working much better than the chat in, um, um, in Zoom. Uh, so we'll be sure to be using Padlet from now on from questions. Um, and now a quick overview at day two tomorrow, again from 9.30 um, GMT to 12.30, we're going to be looking at licensing data in copyrightable data, how you can actually copyright your data, how do you make sure the data you're using is actually under a specific license? Can you use it? Can you distribute it? Can you adapt it, et cetera, et cetera? And we're going to address the questions from today around the licensing. We will be looking at copyright exceptions in infringement. What happens if you infringe copyright? What about the copyright in the international context? As we've seen, yes, the Berne Convention, we have a lot of countries. However, there are differences when it comes to legislation in different countries across the globe. 
copyright in social media. And we value copyright in social media separately um, because um, we have had a lot of different queries um, in the last few years about, okay, so I want to use Twitter data, Instagram data, how do I use it? Okay, I've used it, can I actually share this or what can I share from it? Then we're going to have a group discussion. We're going to have a couple of scenarios. Okay, so a researcher has used X, Y, Z. Can the data be shared? And actually trying to apply all the different um, uh, aspects that we've learned today. And we'll um, close the workshop with a couple of showcases that demonstrate how copyright issues can actually be overcome um, in data. So say you use copyrightable data, you can't get permission to publish or derive data. What do you do? Is there something to put the data out there? And you're going to see a couple of examples um, tomorrow. I did prepare a very fast menti, but I am aware we're over time. Um, it was just around the most interesting thing fact you've learned today. Um, if you want to complete it after the, um, after the session, it would be fantastic for us to have a look and see, okay, so what did you think was the most interesting thing or fact that you've um, learned during the session today? Um, but we do have the uh, feedback form as well, which would, would be uh, very happy as many of you to complete, which will circulate tomorrow. Um, thank you all ever so much for joining today. Thank you, um, Hira, Maureen, and Hannah for presenting today. And we'll see you all tomorrow um, at half nine. We do hope you've, um, you've enjoyed the, the sessions.